You have Julio Morales as our Senior Managing Director at Cosmont Financial Services. I founded Cosmont in 1986. I was a 26-year-old city manager just at the time Prop 13 had passed. And I think I became city manager because no one knew what to do, so they gave it to a kid. We put this class actually together specifically for this uh, presentation. It's a, it's a, uh, a combination, a compilation of a lot of the work that we do. I'd like to just, this is not so much of an advertisement, I just want you to see how we view the world. At Cosmont, as we've evolved since 1986, when I started this company to focus on what I call public-private transactions, that's really morphed into a much different world of the convergence of economic development, real estate, and public finance. So the way we've organized our shop is to have expertise in all three of these areas. And the reason why that's important to me is because in my view, you really can't manage a community today in a post-COVID world without understanding how private investment has morphed and changed. Remember, when you're running a city like all of you are, one way or the other, I'm gonna stand up here so I can see my slides a little better, it's really a function of being a service business in an economy that's consumer driven. And so, the way this economy services consumers is to make investments in goods, in services, and make investment in real estate. We as cities really are a catch basin for those investments, right? We turn it around in something called taxes and fees, and then we provide services, some of them unique, police and fire and so on. Others competitive with the private sector. To some extent, recreation is competitive with the private sector. So it's a combination of things. But we are, make no mistake, in the public sector, we're a service business and a series of service businesses. So service businesses really only operate in the taxation form that we're in when they can capture value from private sector investment. And that was easy enough to do in the 80s because one of my favorite lines, I remember I was running one of the cities I was running, and one council member said to me, he goes, what's the issue? Just get me a Costco. And, uh, and we're done, you know? <laughs> well, guess what? Getting a Costco today doesn't really get you much. It gets you a big box that competes with internet sales sometimes, sometimes their own internet sales, but it doesn't get you quality of life. It doesn't get you, I'll, I'll go ahead and manage it, okay? Uh, I got it. And it doesn't get you uh, the kind of uh, flexibility to capture private investment today because sales tax is not where private investment is at. So as a function, we operate as a mirror to private investment and consumer activity. For us, we're at a crossroads. We call this the great reconfiguration. And all of you are council members, city managers, directors in a time where I think it is fundamentally shifted as to how you can manage the financial future of your community. It's just a different vocabulary. It's a different set of activities. You see it in your own kids. They're digitally bound forever. They're environmentally bound forever. My, one of my favorite discussions, I can't use a plastic bag in my own household anymore because my 12-year-old daughter looks at me like she's about to just commit murder. You know, and it's just a whole different set of, of parameters for private investment if they're going to capture the wallets of this generation that's moving forward. Then you accelerate that by COVID, which just said, okay, I'm going to put digitalization on fast forward. And then you basically are a city and you're going, wow, what happened? All I have is taxes and zoning. And all of a sudden, everybody just wants to build a bunch of houses, don't make me any money and they want to shut down the retail, which used to make me money, and the hotels are questionable because we're not sure yet. Some are doing well, some aren't. And here's the next chapter in the book. In the next four to five months, we're gonna read nonstop articles about offices going into foreclosure. That's the next shoe to drop. Okay, so what do we do? These slides will show you in the next section here how this configuration sort of shifts the mindset that you have to have. So when Julio comes on and talks about budgeting, what we're saying to you is budgeting is a really traditional form of figuring out where your community is financially and understanding your audits and your assets and your surpluses and your deficits and your obligations are really key. 
But it doesn't really matter if you understand all that if you don't know where you're going with your local economy. Because to just do budgets to tread water makes no sense. And the thing that makes Julio so exceptional is he's been a city manager. He and I have worked on this hard because we think today, because of this post-COVID digital world, because our taxes have stayed in place, there's no new tax category. Yeah, there's a new category of spend. It's in my hip pocket. It's called a telephone. But there's no new category of taxes. There are new fees, but you know the fees in California are capped by the cost of providing the service, right? So what do we do to sort of generate currency when consumers have shifted? They're driven by quality of life. They're concerned about the cost of their living. They want amenities. Their family wants amenities. Of course, they want safety and security, but they're looking for sustainability. They're looking for experiences. They're looking for communities that can provide all of that. Why? Because guess what? They're not getting in a car every day anymore to drive to work. No one's gonna basically sacrifice getting, losing that, the time that they gain back and losing it again. And right now, every major employer that thought they had the lever of just calling people back to work, even the Microsofts and the Googles of the world are realizing that the very trends that they invested in have given people so much freedom that they can't get their own employees back in for five days, otherwise they lose them to someone else who's willing not to, right? So change world. So the investors know that, and they're putting their money into returns that are based on this shifting demand. And what's the shifting demand? The demand is, I'm willing to stay home, I'm willing to buy from home, I'm willing to stay longer in a community, and that's just my mindset, and City Hall, is driven as a reflection of those demands. In addition, City Hall has another pressure. Big brother called the state of California, right? And they're basically saying, look, we have a housing shortage, so we're gonna drive you based on policy. We're gonna drive you toward density that you may or may not want because we know what's better for you. So that's the scenario that we find ourselves. So just kind of breaking it down a little bit. Residents want a 15 minute community. Consumers want all the conveniences. Work will never be the same. Telework and hybrid offices are really changing how we look at our day to day existence. To the point where people can now just decide if they want to go out of state and still poach a job in California, especially if they're in a technology remote business. So commuting patterns are changing because lifestyle patterns have changed. And the reality is that people, when they're making decisions about communities, when they're making decisions about a house, when they're making decisions about a job, are thinking about how can I sort of play and exist and shop and get experiences and get services in a most cost-effective and convenient way. Investors have responded. They've responded because, one, they know housing is in high demand. So what does that mean for you? As a city leader, you're gonna get applications for housing much more than you're gonna get applications for retail. You're gonna beg for retail, and you're gonna basically go, whoa, I'm overwhelmed on housing. We'd like to have our leaders think about this a little bit differently, by the way. We think that that's not the, the actual right response, but we'll talk about that in a while. Telework will reshape the office environment. Brick and mortar is struggling to get balance, to get balance, because brick and mortar is not going away it certainly is, and now that we're past COVID, we're seeing some resilience in, in consumer-based retail, but we're seeing a different kind of retail. So here's the thing, you can go to a Target now and never go inside Target, right? You can go to a shopping center and get medical services because some of the occupancy has shifted to things that are practical, education, medicine, service, fitness, food, entertainment. That's the product mix. Here's the reality for us is that those are mostly not sales tax generators, right? So what's the only way to generate sales tax out of that mix of retail storefronts? Rooftops, residential. So even though the state is bullying us on residential, the reality is in this marketplace, the residential unit is a spend unit. And from our perspective at Cosmont, we think as we're starting to do these, uh, what we call housing elements as economic development, these templates, 
what we're finding is we're slightly better off figuring out how to capture that density and attract exactly the kind of retail and services that our consumers and residents want, and then we have a better capture of what's left. And the property tax, as Julio will show you, is a pretty consistent form of revenue. So it's not the Costco, it's not the panacea of a power center, but it's also not a world that wants to go to a power center anymore. So it's just different, and we have to know that. Our wallets got shifted in this economy because the people that spend money are spending it differently. So as a result of that, distribution is now an economic driver, and distribution is a big discussion. But here's the discussion for us. If we're in an infill or a suburban infill community, the ability to have quick delivery is a function of quality of life for these families because they make the decision to buy on the phone or buy on their iPad or so on, and we have to be able to make sure that they can get those goods. Otherwise, we're just not as competitive. So what we say is that, and remember, this is a prelude to how you're going to look at budget and finance. And the reason why these are integrated is because if you solve your budget and finance issues for getting to a balanced budget, okay, it's not a terrible job, but you're a C student. If you solve your budget for attracting revenues over the long haul that make your budget better year after year in an economy that's not made it easy to do that because you can't solve it just on sales tax alone anymore, that's an A student. Finding out the magical formula of how to use economic development as a progenitor, if you will, of economic activity to make your budget better is where you want to go. And so the things that drive that decision project process in budgeting is state policy. One, state policy pushes you in a different direction every time. And it may be pushing you in a direction you don't want to be in because there is a reaction locally to say, we just don't want dense housing. Okay, I, I, I understand that. But in a consumer-based economy that's looking for a place to live that they want to spend 15 hours a day in instead of you know, eight hours a day in, saying no to density is saying no to half a person's wallet. Remember, we had a lot of communities where people woke up at seven, left by eight, and didn't come back till six. Today, on a lot of days, people are staying all day or they're staying all week. And so we have the opportunity of capturing their wallet. Then the economy says, okay, capture my wallet, but you're not capturing it at a retail center. Okay, well then I've got to offer you a service and a good, or an entertainment source, or good food, or a whole bunch of medical for conveniences for you to get out of your house and spend the money on things that you would normally go to a store for. You're not in this alone. The retailers also have to figure out how to get people out the door. So it's not like you're just solving this on your own. It's whether or not you can capture it. The other way is through land use. If you're going to use land use to sort of rebuff density, if you're going to use land use to just figure out how to preserve the sales tax you have, it's a misappropriation of that set of jurisdictional laws that you have. To us, land use is a way of manufacturing value. It's just that we didn't have to do that before. But we have been a bunch of cities and counties that have approved specific plans that give away density as a matter of right to the owners of property that have no intention of upgrading their property because they already have a lease, they're owned by a family trust, and they're happy the way things are. And what ends up happening is we have old and tired retail corridors or neighborhoods that aren't getting revitalized. When we approve density and we keep it in a bucket for ourselves and then trade it out for density in a development agreement, and pre-approve a list of, of community amenities that we're willing to trade for when we give someone density, that's a different approach. We call that monetizing zoning. We call it creating currency. That's a different way is of getting, again, how you're of figuring out how to move your community forward in a world that's changed. And then finally, economic development. Today, we can't just focus on large employers anymore because People are just on standalone businesses. They're home, they're working, and we have to attract workers through attractive housing and attractive communities. So that's the backstop. Those are the changes, and we have to make our changes and have that mindset as we go forward. So summarizing all of what I've said is, you can manage your zoning, you can manage your budget, you can manage your economic development, 
using the old words principles. I say good luck. I say we're moving to an economy where our kids won't even possibly own a car, right? They might license a ride. They might co-mingle an Uber between four people or 20 people. They might condominiumize an SUV. But the more they can do that, the happier they're going to be. And so we have to realize that the old world only gets harder and more expensive for us. It really requires things that are no longer viable. And the new world is talking about finding a way to find a reasonable nexus of some housing density next to retail, of finding a home for industrial distribution that gets goods to your local consumers as quickly as possible, of creating jobs that are technology-based or are much more in the mode of what an educated millennial or Generation Z community wants to work in, a lot of it being from home, those are the things that will drive your taxes. Those are the things that will create higher, higher values. And as I said earlier, we're not going back to, when I was 27, year old, 27 years old running the city of Bell Gardens, the goal was to create taxes through, through sales tax. By the time I had left cities in 1986 to start Cosmont, it was still about chasing retail centers. In 2020 and 2022, it's about chasing blended use. It's a different chase. And so it's like we put these up because life changes. I love the last one, right? Being ready for rock and roll Pearl Jam, being a roadie for Pearl Jam is cool, but it doesn't really give you the credentials for running your community today, right? What sounded great 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago is not quite what you need. And the thing that is so interesting to us is that there's not one product type that is the same. Hotel has reset forever, much more uh, long-term or vacation stayed, in, in other words, either destination or functionality. Retail totally reimagining, office is re reconfiguring. God knows what office will be. I think, you know, you'll read, uh, just as a sidestep, I read a lot about, well, you know, office is going to reconfigure to housing. And I'm not so sure. And here's why. Most of the office that exists in downtown cores are sort of a 44-foot bay, you know, from glass to glass. And residential wants to be in the 25 to 30 range. So you've got, you're sitting with 10 to 15 feet of corridor space, double loaded, that make no sense for residential. So they're not easy conversion. So, that's just a fix that's going to play itself out. Some of the older office will change quicker than the newer office, I think. Larry, does older office convert easier? Yeah, it does think? convert easier. It tends to be less like dense. Like in a downtown core. Yes, floor. right. And I think the other thing is, and we could talk about this all day, Back, we're going to be talking about economic development, but we're seeing a lot of covered land plays now where large funds are buying let's say what I call Woody walk-up offices, the kind of coal centers that were built in Orange County, right? And they will buy them at an office price, discounted, and they'll either ask you to rezone for industrial or residential, because those are higher value than office. But they'll buy the office at current discounts, and they'll do what I call a covered land play. They'll let the leases that are there run out, because they'll rely on that revenue to pay for the price that they bought that property. And then they'll come in and do a zone change, knock it down, and redo it. The reason that's not great for us is because we have to wait for the private sector to get its return on the covered land play. And essentially, it puts those properties in checkmate for a while or in check. You know, So that's why, again, these are all little anecdotes that we can give you that say, you got to watch how you use your land use. You have to figure out how you use your zoning, and you have to understand where your budget is because what you have today may not carry you through unless you get aggressive and you get strategic about how to induce these kinds of innovations. Because this is how the world will work. I mean, retail is going to be blended use. Curbside pickup is going to change the way even the big and middle boxes operate. Restaurants will change. You'll see a lot more commingled restaurants and ghost kitchens. It's just all different. That one of my favorite slides is that J.C. Penney store turning into an Amazon store. And so here's the interesting notion about that. 
Amazon has just figured out that they're probably not going to be in the retail business, and they're starting to downsize that. You know, they close the fresh stores. They're really figuring out that they do better on a digital world. The thing is, is that they are subsidizing the digital world because they're providing free or very low-cost shipping, and that is not a sustainable model for them. So we're in for some shifts. And for us, what do we respond? So I had a slide one time that showed four different lobbies. Hotel, office, um, a bank, and a upscale new apartment building. And it showed sort of the common space. And I, it was unlabeled, and I'd ask people, which is which? You know the answer is? They all look the same. The hotel lobby looks the same as an office lobby, looks the same as a residential uh, common space lobby. Monochromatic beige tone. Right, beige with couches and places to sit on your phone or sit on your computer or work. And that's the world we're going to. It becomes experience-based. People can have a choice to pick a comfortable place to live or to work or to co-mingle, and they can do it in a center, they can do it in a, in a district, they can do it in a hotel, they can do it in a creative office scenario. So your question, I'm about to hand this over to Julio, your question, given that we're in a changing world, your question, given that even the private sector doesn't quite yet understand how it's gonna make money, and so what it's asking you for today is probably a 10 to 15 year solution. A shopping center was a 40 year solution. 40 years ago. 40 years ago. So how do I add housing and comply with Rena? How do I fix regional shopping centers in a way that makes sense today? I can't fix them with retail. How do I replace my sales tax? Is it rooftops? What's the right balance? How do I revitalize a downtown? I mean, a downtown is a different place. You know, we never, we would always say, well, let's get some restaurants, let's get some office. Now it's, let's put retail, uh, let's put residential above the retail. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Even the retail on the ground floor is empty and the residential's full. You see that. How do I create an 18 hour community? How do I meet these ever stringent state requirements and pay, back to my point, we're a service business. It's all about paying for service demands. And so I would end this up by saying, look, it's really when you start getting to the budget and the finance, where Julio will take you, he's going to show you how you understand your audit. He's going to show you how you balance your budget. He's going to show you how to be strategic about things that cost you a lot of money, like your unfunded accrued liabilities. Here's the thing I'm trying to, enforce, to, to reinforce with you. When you enter his world, it's really easy to just think that if I fix this box, I fix something. And what we're saying is, no, not really. What's in your wallet? Who wants your wallet? What does your community need and where does it want to be? And how do you get the resources to get you there? Because the whole thing about budget and finance is setting up for community prosperity. It's just the budget and finance is a check balancing activity in a world that wants you to do strategic financial planning. And that's where I think Julio brings an edge because he knows how to do both. Budget and finance is the prelude and the aftermath of economic development and land use. I know, why do I have to go first? Because there's no I in team. It's really up to all of us to figure this out. We'll show you some solutions at the back end. We've, answered, we've asked some tough questions in the front end and presented some, I think, very conflicting and often confusing paradigms that we have to deal with. But there is a way to do it. We have economic development tools, we have strategies, and we have skill sets. And I think our communities are up to the task. Here's the thing, if you show up in your city council meeting and you're still thinking about fixing a retail center, and you're still about thinking about fixing a downtown with retail, and you're fighting industrial distribution, and you're fighting density, you're just really not paying attention to where the private sector wants to make the investment. I don't think it's about the fight. I think it's about the bite. How do you bite into that equation, make it work for you? That's what we'd like you to think about. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'm gonna hand it to you, Julio. It's interesting, you guys are the policymakers, and I'm gonna tell you, none of you wanna come here and listen to me. I'm well aware of this. You all have a vision of how to shape that community. But when I started as a CFO and I became a city manager, I knew the one thing is, all of you had a vision you wanna get there. 
But I also am a finance person because if you can't afford it, you're not going anywhere. You got a great car, no gas, guess what? You're pushing it, right? So my job is to tell you where these levers are and think about it in that way. Understanding that your objective are these policy decisions. So what Larry and I are gonna to try to do is give you tools to think about it, and then it's your job to shape the policies and go to find that direction. We're not telling you what to do. We're giving you the tools of how and how to get there and how to think about that. Now, having said all that, oh God, this is boring. I am not an accountant, by the way. Don't like accountants, not, not my thing. And I also, here's the thing. Your CAFR, your annual report's really important in a way because you wanna make sure that you have the same money in the till. But at the end of the day, if someone goes and looks at the cash register and says there's $105 in there, someone else goes and counts it. That's really what an audit does. They go, there's $105 in the cash register. What's the important question? Someone's stealing the money? Are you wasting your money? Is your business profitable? Those are the important questions. That's what I ask. I don't care that there's $105 in there. I wanna know whether it should have been 112. How do I make 250? That's what you guys think about as the policymakers. So why is that important to understand these funds? It's that we group them in a certain way. I want you to think about this. Your governmental funds are the essential practice of what you do as, a, as, as an entity, as a city. Are there any special district people here? Yeah. Where? Okay, anyone else? You're a JPA, right? Mm -hmm. But no other water district? I'm gonna use the term city here then freely. Okay, that's why I was asking. Okay. Uh, Look, you street sweeping, do your essential functions, police and fire, collect your revenues, uh, give people parking tickets, everyone's favorite. That's what the general part of the general funds does, okay? Then you have proprietary enterprise funds, typically. That is really run like a business, and the laws are set up that you can't charge more than it costs to deliver, typically, water and sewer services. And then lastly, you have special revenue or fiduciary funds that you might hold on behalf of somebody. So really the way you gotta think about it is, this is the main business of uh, the city, our governmental funds. You have an enterprise run like a utility or water. That's, and you, that really is run like a business. The last one is, hey, you can't touch this money or it's made for a specific purpose. Make sense? That's how your audit is compared. I'm not gonna go into it in that perspective. You just need to understand that. So when the finance director starts speaking about things, you'll kinda understand, hey, is this a utility? Is it run like a business? Is it special and segregated away, or is it the essential function of our city? Or your JPA, if you want, for that matter. You guys have like special purpose accounts and everything else. Okay, so those are examples of the type of things. And we're gonna give you this presentation so you have when you go back. By the way, most cities are kind of run the same way. They have about 35 to 50 funds. Bigger cities are a bit more complex, but it's, you'll still have, almost everyone is gonna have like a CDBG fund or a special SELS fund or Quimby funds. You'll get to learn in how to manage that. My expertise was learning to leverage and find a way to use this fund for that thing. That's what actually I was told by the city manager. Julio, we need to do why. How do I fund it? Well, let me see, we're broke. How do I find money? Well, it's because they have special pots and you have to learn creatively how to think about that. And you guys give the direction. It was my job to help you get there. Okay? <sighs> Last thing, accounting. Once again, this is the thing you have to understand. Cash accounting, accrual accounting. Now, in business school, my professor told me one thing. It's kind of interesting, because business school is a different culture. But he basically said all accounting is a form of a lie, and you have to unravel it to one thing. And what is that, Larry? It's cash. All real estate is based on cash. So I think about, as a budget person, I think about cash, what you really have it. Accounting is this weird notion, or accrual accounting basically because oh, I paid for it this time, I recognize that. You guys, I believe I'd recommend focus on the cash. You need to understand everything else, but re are you bringing enough money? This is simple lemonade stand economics. I do it with my son all the time. Hey, I made $4. No, you didn't. Dad subsidized you $7. It's unfortunate being my son, because dad doesn't. <laughs> okay, so look at this. Debit card versus a checkbook. Has anyone balanced a checkbook lately? It was a process, right? Because you're like, well, I have this money in the back end, and I know I wrote this check and it comes in. Debit cards are much more automatic. That is accrual accounting. Cash is your debit card. It comes in and comes, I tell my wife, put it on debit card. I already, it comes in, it comes out. 
So think about that. If I'm going to give you a practical function, try to understand just cash accounting in some sense. Good old horse sense. And how much is coming in, how much is going out. Don't let the accounting fool anyone. By the way, that's what they pay for all those accountants and big corporations to fool you. They hide it. They, hey, that comes from my professor at UCLA. He, he knew what he was talking about. Okay, last thing. This is one thing as a practical part. What's an audit? Okay, look, it's a bunch of people that come in and it's people you did invite to parties back in high school or college because they're accountants, right? And you put them in a really small room back there. And then they come to someone and say, I got a checklist of eight things and I need you to show me these eight things. They don't look at everything. Everyone thinks that they look at everything. No, they look at the most common things and they check and say, they go by. They just want to check off that box and go home. Because you put them in a closet somewhere and it's just not nice when you're 24 years old. It never has windows, it's not a, an enjoyable thing. Now, what is a forensic audit? This is when you have an Enron or something, something's gone wrong. So let me tell you something. Let's say you're a serial killer and you killed a bunch of people and you buried them all in Los, I'm, stick with me, this is good though, okay? So this is accounting, I have to make it enjoyable. About yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm about watch, here's what's going on. No one knows where the bodies are hidden in Los Angeles Forest. Nobody knows. Someone always has to take, isn't that the story? Everyone's seen these shows, someone takes you to that. You, so uh, no one's gonna discover something in a forensic audit. Someone has to know is the point. Someone has to know where the bodies are buried. So I hear this from elected, we're gonna do a forensic audit, we're gonna look over, if you get the state to come and do a forensic audit and you think you're broke, you're gonna be even worse off. Cause you get a million dollar bill from all the accountants and they're not gonna find anything unless someone tells you where the bodies are buried. That's my point. You have to know what's going on in that sense. You're not gonna just discover it automatically. Someone's gonna know, and the great thing, I did go to the Kennedy School, and they taught me the most important thing, the importance of whistleblowers. Because those are the people that Frank said, those that have the ethical, moral compass to know what's right and wrong. And I still believe people understand that. But there will be someone who's gonna stand up and say, this is just wrong. Give me that opportunity to tell you what's going on here. So hopefully I circled back and you see that. I try to make it humorous, but that's really the truth. Someone has to know what's going wrong, and someone will. There are a lot of good employees in government. There are a lot of elected officials who have that right moral compass, but it's hard to understand because, you know, that budget's that thick, right? It's that thick. There are tons of accounts. <laughs> right, I read this stuff, it, and it takes a lot to go through it. Okay. So I'm gonna go over these seven deadly sins of public finance. Look at this, no numbers so far, right? This is a great class. Okay, first one, balance the budget with one-time fixes. This should be obvious, what's a one-time fix? I got this grant money, don't hire someone. You get a bonus, build a pool, don't have a child, like I did, I have a two-year-old. I don't always take my own advice. Okay, number two, ignoring long-term consequences of a deal. The master just left, but this is absolutely the truth. Spend the money on good consultants who are gonna tell you what's right and wrong. Think about the long-term consequences. And this goes, oh my God, same thing. That actually, my term as a finance guy, pay attention to the operating costs. It is so easy to get money for a new pool or a new transit system. Pay attention to the operating costs. So how much does the new pool cost you? Already, how much is the new pool? I mean, it probably costs anywhere between 20 and 30 million. Yeah. How much does it cost to maintain that pool? Probably gonna be about a million a year. There you go. Now, you get 10 million from this one, five million here, your bond issue, and now, oh wait, a million dollars operating costs? That conversation is over, right? But people think about it, I just need $20 million. It's kind of like, I could just afford the car, but I can't pay for the gas, and the insurance, and everything else. So, uh, it, taking on too much. Same kind of thing on that deal. Think about phasing things. Think about what you can truly afford. The vision can be there, but it's really being, none of this is really genius, is it? Like, well, Julio, that's obvious. Okay, misapplying a temporary windfall. I'm gonna get over this, but think about that. Hey, if times are good, and they were a while ago, did you squirrel away enough money? And I'm gonna talk about when you think you should squirrel away money, what type of cities, based on your revenue structure, should squirrel away more? Okay, shortchanging pension obligations. 
by the way, I am like the pension guy in California. I, it's my name now. I've done like 50 clients on pensions. I went back and I talked about this because it's the largest, most significant issue that any of you probably have now inherited, by the way. And it happened 20 years ago, so I'm not blaming anyone, no one should, but it's unfortunately now your problem because people are passing along. I'll talk about that later, but it's big, a really big issue. Okay, making unrealistic projections about rate of return. Where's Larry? These are great things. So you're gonna get into P3 and you're gonna think the greatest term. But in reality, government is inherently risk averse, right? And the private sector is not. At a certain point, you gotta go, okay, how is this measured? And I have to think in a more conservative manner. And ignoring financial checks and balances. There's a process, some of these things make sense, someone's gonna tell you that. Not to say that you should always listen to the naysayer. You guys are the people with the vision, you understand where you wanna be, hopefully you're thinking about your land use decisions, but all these are just standard good old horse sense behind it. Hopefully you stick with them. A lot of these things my dad told me, and he's a psychiatrist, but they stuck with me. He's an immigrant. Just told me really basic things he go through, and I listened to him throughout most of my career. By the way, as a financial advisor, as a CFO of a city, you can't have financial problems, right? I always tell this to my wife, you can't spend too much because I can't be bankrupt, <laughs> right? I can't, I have to live by that same credo. In a way, when people say, hey, I'm financially conservative, then you have to live by that. You, as a policymaking board, are saying, I want this you know, financial discipline, then you actually have to, and I, oh, Pardon me for saying this. They go through, they adopt the budget one second later, and then they make a financially indisciplined comment or decision five seconds later, right? It is being consistent all the time about what you're doing. And that's what Larry was saying. I'm not giving you anything other than try to make these decisions, base it on a certain perspective, and then you're able to really change the community because you have the resources to make that investment. Okay, um, has anyone ever seen this? Okay, let's read it. Certificate and Achievement for Excellence in Financial Report. Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. You go to the city of Stockton and the city of Bernard, uh, San Bernardino, two famous bankrupt cities, and what are you gonna see on the walls of the finance department? <laughs> 10 of those lined up and framed. No, I'm not kidding. Because I worked in El Monte and Huntington Park, I left PFM to go into two cities that were literally facing bankruptcy. And I found it as a challenge. I'm kind of, you know, sadistic in that sense of myself, going, why would I want a policeman? Because it's a challenge. But when I had these on the walls, the first thing I did that day is I took every single one down. I'm like, I'm going into closed session having conversations about bankruptcy, and you think we have awards. Those awards, they're good for one reason. They're just check boxes. It does not mean you're in good financial standing. Don't let anyone tell you differently. GFOA does not like me, and I was on the National Debt Advisory Committee, by the way, so <laughs> on the GFOA, but those don't mean what you think they mean. It doesn't mean you have a good budget, doesn't mean you're balanced, it doesn't mean your CAFR is fantastic, it means you went onto the check boxes and formatted it the right way. Now I think these are the things you have to know as elected officials, because, oh look, we got this award, that's great. It's good for the community, tell me you're doing the right thing. Doesn't mean you're in good financial position. It's kind of like, hey, you write really nice checks, I love the handwriting, but there's no money in the checking account. That's what they're saying. I can, I can read it, that's great penmanship. It's a penmanship You're award. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, let's take a vote. One, two, three, four, which one's your favorite? They said to think outside the box, I assume that meant law. I like that one, our books are balanced, 50% our numbers are real and 50% are made up. <laughs> Play around with these figures, Harry. I've given the total, I want you to add them up. And someday all these anonymous offshore accounts will belong to shell companies of which you will deny all knowledge. <laughs> you vote, which one? I kinda like the, that one at WorldCom. Okay, I'm gonna talk about actually how to evaluate your financial health and how to translate this into things that are practical. Hopefully I have not bored you with a lot of acronyms that really thought about things that like, these aren't really revolutionary thoughts. So this is called a financial scorecard. This is actually something that I developed based on years and tried to say everyone has all these ideas of benchmarks. And I think some of them are really ap apropos. One, it's a one page benchmark, 42 different measures that you look at and say, okay, 
We start with revenues, then we go to expenses, then solvency, then policy plans and practices. Why this is important for a city council, can tell, someone tell me why I start at the top and why more points are allocated to, to solvency than revenues, for, for example? It's about control. You have no control over revenues. None, they just come in. You may set a policy by changing maybe a sales tax, once every 12 years you now change that, but essentially the revenues come in. You can think about it, and I'll go back because Larry was talking about a way to change your revenues with your property tax, but for the most part you can't change your sales tax easily. You can bring in a store, but then you can't make people spend money. Not easily. Expenses, you do have direct control over, but I'm actually gonna tell you, you don't. With minimum staffing, and the cost structures to maintain basic services, there's not much you can change in a budget. Solvency, you can. That is 100% the city council's decision. You got some excess money, what do we do with it? Spend it. 100 ice cream bars for every single person, or you save it. That is clearly, that, that is your decision. You are the policy making board, you decide to be fiscally conservative, that is your decision. Policy plans and practice, the same thing. You implement that as the policy making board. So, there are a lot of concepts out there, and what you really got to think about are what are the ones that really make sense. Okay, let's, let's talk about a bond rating versus a financial health. Has anyone here issued a bond? Mark has. Okay, look, a bond is just a loan. You go out to the markets, and you get a loan essentially for the capital markets. Investors, like the ones who have commercials on Sunday, with guys talking real quiet, you know. Fidelity does it. Those are the ones who buy the bonds for you. You get a loan, it's cheaper than a bank. I'll go over it later on, so I'm going through it. Your financial health is somewhat different. The bond rating agencies, there are three of them, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P, say you get either, an, in most municipalities, it's between, well it is, a triple B to triple A is investment grade, and they give you a rating. Most cities are A to double A rated. Some cities, like the Pasadenas of the world, are triple A. Now there's a lot more triple A's, actually. It used to be very rare, but there are now a lot more of them. Your financial health is something different. These guys are concerned with your ability to repay your bonds. Your financial health is about economic resiliency. When you have a new project, you need money to go pay for things or the ability to withstand a downfall. They're kind of related, but they're other things. So I'm talking about economic resiliency, the ability for you to implement the policies that you want to do. So it's more than just the debt service. It's how you handle payroll and retirement and all the other obligations you have. The big one for you as a policy making board, level of service, right? It's all about level of service. There are certain things you have to do. You have to pay your bonds, that's a fixed recovery. But it all comes down to level of service, right? How many police on this force? How, how long does that library stay open? What about the enhancements of the park? Those are the things, by the way, that residents care about. Not Julio's level reserve is 37%, he should be really happy. They care that the library is open two more hours a day at night. But you may need some money for the downturn. Okay, this is the precursor to that first question. Revenue should be looked at based on volatility. This is a concept from the Brookings Institute that the gentleman at the LEECD had taken. So I really like it. And I look at, has anyone taken an economics class? You talk about elasticity, this is a, a relation to price, basically how sensitive something is to price or variations in the economy. So the simplest thing to think about is the more volatile revenue source. What's that one? Red, what's red? Sales tax. Development related fees. What isn't in there also is TOT. Those are highly dependent on economic cycles. They're great, everyone loves them. They love them because they added, they goosed up your system, but they go up and they go down, they're more volatile. Look at that, plain old property tax, not sexy, but it is for financial stability. It is for economic resilience. It's called real estate, because it's real, right? It does not really go that much, it stays with you. Now, I do have an MBA in finance and real estate. Most of the classes I took are in real estate at UCLA, do you know why? because everything in California is based on land. And this image was formed in 1978 watching Superman. Anyone seen Superman the movie? The old one? What did he do? He wanted to take out all that old land and basically create a new beachfront. 
But what does it basically tell you? This is expensive land on the coast and some other area. Land is where all your value is and you have to find a way to capture that. That's what Larry talks about, that value capture. Think about that. You as a, by the way, no one knows when they go between Glendale and Burbank, do they? Is there like a, a line, like some Maginot line, they dig a truck? No, you just go from one place to the other. So sales tax go from one place to the other. But when you own something on one place, it goes to your part. There's no transportation of, of property tax. There is of sales tax. You can get retail leakage. So looking at your revenue structure, that's the first thing. Understand how much you have of each one and then try to make appropriate changes. Now we're gonna look at the sales tax. Is every dollar the same? No. Some areas are more volatile than the others. So this is CDTFA. By the way, this is 19, 2019 data. I come up with something called the volatility score. I look at the distribution, some things are more volatile than others. Gasoline, really volatile. By the way, those standard deviations, a change year over year, changed after COVID. And that score was on average 4.8%. That volatility score for statewide was 4.8 in 2019. It's now 6.0. In other words, sales tax has gotten even more volatile. Kind of makes sense. We've all experienced it. It's also who you have. In this one city, they have one major, one major concrete provider. If they leave, you got a problem. If they change the point of sale, you have a problem. Analyze it. This is the only time you got to pay attention to this. It's very detailed. But you, you know it, you live in your community, you know that one big business, and if, if they're gone, you're like, oh my God. I was the city manager of Huntington Park, do you know who my biggest sales tax producer was? A BMW dealership. Oh, yeah. Alexander. Alexander BMW. I would talk. Right, he's in the warehouse district. <laughs> but it's Huntington Park, like $900,000 a year. If I lost him, that would be tragic. You wouldn't know that's right south of you, right? Yeah, you're right. You're right next door. So you pay attention. You pay attention to who your sales tax providers are. Look at that volatility. These are the things. You can just get that report, get that now. You already know. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You live in your community, you know it better than I do. I need a chart to tell me. And then I use Google Maps to look. But you already know. You've lived there. You've been there for a long time. I'm just kind of putting a framework behind it. Okay, now this is a great chart. This is what I'm trying to show you. Look at your sales tax. You like a nice steady stream. Why do you like a nice steady stream? Because that is what you have negotiated for your contracts with your employees who get a raise of 3% every year. And what happens when your sales tax is your major producer and you go down 10%? You got problems. That's, now if you are highly sales tax based, you need more revenues and more, uh, sorry, more reserves. So it really depends. Now, if you're a city that has a lot of property tax, not as much. So you should understand. Ah. So my framework to Larry is the economic part. Property tax, even during the downturn, the worst housing crisis we've ever had, declined a little bit. That's not market values, by the way. I'm only talking about you guys as a city. Your fiduciary perspective is what happened to property tax, not home values. That's a good question. So here, let's look at that. This is market price versus assessed value. Does everyone know how assessed value works? They only change it when you sell the property and it goes up 2% or less every year. So there's an inherent buffer between the market price and the assessed value in LA County. And in California, it's basically the same way. In other states, it's not like that. But none of you from out, none of you live in Cal, outside of California, right? This is all California based, just to make sure. Okay. So this is, this is really critical for you. Housing prices, as you see, that's great. Now, the other thing is you want rollover. You want to change housing stock because you're not going to capture the value unless they actually, so if it stays, as Larry was saying, it, if it stays in a family trust, what happens? The SS value base stays. The value goes up in the property. They can take out loans. What happens to you as a city? Yes. Nothing. Yes. Uh, that's right. So in a way, this change, this reconfiguration is good for your community. That being that you get a revenue source, right? It can change. You want to participate in that upside as well. So think about that. That is stable. I'm going to tell you a tale of two cities right here. 
LA County in general, Arcadia, and Palmdale. Now, if you start in 2007, boy, things were looking good for Palmdale, weren't they? And then the market crashed. And they went down and pretty much have never quite recuperated from their position. Now, I'm not trying to pick on a client in any sense. And Arcadia did great during that recession. They actually did not drop at all. Even though AVs went down, Arcadia kept going up. Now, this is a story about understanding revenue structure. If you're a fast-growing city and you have a lot of property and a lot of new development, it's great during the uptime. But if there's a down, because you had a lot of new homes, your property tax is likely going to go down with assessments. Where if you have older established communities, not as much. Glendale, that's not going to happen. There's not tons of Melrose being built. If you're in Eastvale, you got to pay attention to this. If you're in Moreno Valley, yeah, it's going to be different. So it depends on the characterization. I did not answer your question per se, but I am going to go over to the GFOA component. OK. General fund expenses. I don't know if anyone's really told you this, but there's not much you can do on a budget. I mean, let's be honest. No one wants to cut payroll. Politically, we all know that's a, a nightmare and difficult. So, OK, I got people. I got benefits. I got medical. Uh, I got to turn on the lights. I got admin. I got lawsuits, which you guys deal with all the time. Capital repair and replacement. OK, I can only defer that so long. So what can you move? Yeah, almost nothing. You don't have a lot of flexibility. In the general fund, that is. That's where you get a lot of the grant funding to pay for other things. That's where you're looking creatively. But unfortunately, there's not here. A lot of this is very fixed or not significantly easy to cut in a practical basis. Let me be practical. What you can really do politically and say, hey, Elon Musk can cut 10 people on a tweet in 10 seconds or 10% 10, 10 of his workforce. We're not able to do that in, in our world. Okay? Let's be practical about what we can and cannot do. You can say something, but it's not going to happen in reality. So you, you're not able to do very much. So I'm going to talk about this real quickly because a lot of people don't know why pension is so significant. I didn't know this still has this. Does everyone understand how their pension costs kind of come out? There's really three components. Your normal cost, which is your current light bill. The employees pay a portion. And there's something called your UAL, which is a past due amount. So if you pay your police officer uh, $100,000 a year, the cost of just the pension is another $85,000 in this example. The cost of medical, and all of a sudden, you got two bills for one police officer. Plus to outfit the car, right? That car's uh, $35,000 for the Crown Vic, another $22,000 to outfit it at least, right? Plus the gas and everything else. They are expensive. Now, I am really good friends with police chief in Anaheim. He also is Peruvian. Um, but we know the cost, and you have to practically think about this. So this is why you have to understand this. It's not $100,000 to put them on the street. It's $225,000 to put a policeman on. Now, I don't know about it. How many of you is, uh, live in a city where the average household income is $225,000? Right, no one from Atherton, OK? So that's why it's so critical. And by the way, they cost about the same in Southgate as they do in Beverly Hills. OK. Establishing reserves, this is what you wanted, right? Sorry, I had to go through five slides, so we're going to go through it. Three things you got to know about. Economic uncertainty, I went into that at nauseum, but it's really critical. That's really, that squirrel is telling you, I need 25 nuts for my winter, right? Because I know what they are, and there are ways for you to quantify that. But you have to understand how much you need. And this is all it is, is thinking about it strategically. How much do I really need? Well, it's a two-week trip on the ocean. I need a certain amount of Provisions, that's the way you're thinking about it. Working capital requirement, I'll go over in a second, but really think about that. There's a variation of your cash flows here. If you have a lot of property tax, you get it twice a year. What do you pay payroll? Every two weeks. There's gonna be a point right before December where you're gonna need to borrow cash. That's just knowing that every year. You do simple cash flow, working capital. Last one, emergency events. Now this is important, let's talk about this. Who has wildfires here? You do, and um, what city are you with? Camarillo. Who else has wildfires? Okay, Cloverdale. Oh, there you go. So tell me, do you have money set aside? FEMA gives you money, right? Yeah. They don't give you everything, do they? 
Now the best, if you got triple A bureaucrats, you get, ah, oh, I like this. It takes a long time. You, they, you never get everything because the regulations are impossible to go through, right? So you, but you also have them, they're consistent, right, David? Yeah, last two, three wildfires, well, don't expect one, expect three when you budget for that reserve. Let's not be optimistic for that. And let's find out how much it costs. So it's easy to set that reserve. Working capital, I just told you. And the third one, we already talked about it, unfortunately, at nauseum with a lot of pretty charts with the charts. Hey, what's my revenue structure look like? These are the GFOA's guidelines. I think they really make sense in thinking about that. That rule of thumb, 18%, 12%, I think should be broken down thinking about why you need those reserves. Numbers are great. Now, if you have a whole year's worth of reserves, you're in a really good condition. A lot of water funds are like that. They have lots and lots of money. Cities don't op operate like that very often. So this is the way you think about it. Be more than happy to send an even email. The GFOA comes in, and it's a good, smart way of thinking how to set reserves. Is that helpful? This, by the way, is your working capital requirement when I was talking about monthly cash flows. Simple. When cash comes in and not, you know how much you go down. This is checkbook accounting. If you know you're broke by the 27th of the month, that's all you gotta know, okay? It's just like a city. Hey, by November, we're broke. We need to have this much money. We need, last year, we were short $2 million. Guess what? At the end of the budget cycle, we're putting aside $2.5 million for this. Remember last time we had to borrow, do some kind of other fund. It isn't hard. It's that consistency that you go through these processes. Policy plans and practices. You have 100% control over this. You direct staff to do this, you adopt these things, and you think about the vision of what you want to do with all of them. By the way, it is not important for you to adopt a plan in practice. That's a checklist that the auditor, hey, you have one of these, great. The rating agencies like that. As it is most important that you as a board work together and think about it and go through the process of drafting the document. This is like, oh God, I sound like a teacher. Hey, getting the homework from some other person and you got credit is not gonna do you well. You actually have to go through the practice and understand why you're doing it. Going and saying, hey, I got something off the checklist isn't as important. What the rating agencies ask me is like, oh, show me the workshop. Or did you just go put it on the agenda and no one reviewed it? They wanna see the presentation that you did for the policy to know that you were paying attention to that. So going through the process is more important than actually having the policy. So the type of policy you talk, reserve policy. Once again, thinking about those three categories. Investment and debt management policy are legally required now. Pension funding plan, pension funding policy. You don't have to pay it all, all of it once, but if you have a plan and you stick to it, that's what's critical. Because then you can go back and say, hey, remember, and that goes with your bargain unit. We as a policy decided this is how we're gonna pay off our liability so you can afford to retire or actually have a retirement. And we said we're gonna do it in 10 years. Here's our plan. Oh, let me tell you one side thing. If you don't, you have a pension and you stay at 70% funded and you don't fund it, what's a retiree get ultimately? 70 cents on the dollar. Oh no, but you said you're gonna, yeah, but if I don't have the money, then that's what you get. CalPERS will not make you whole. CalPERS is like a bank account. If you have $200 in your account and you have zero, guess what? You have zero and you have $200 in your account. So you have 4,000 different agencies and if you're not well funded, that employee should understand that. I don't think they get that. They think they have a CalPERS account. CalPERS is like a bank. Does that make sense to everyone? I'll go back over this again, but let the, the employees are the ones that have to kind of sink that in. Oh, I don't have a CalPERS. No, you don't have a CalPERS pension. CalPERS invested, the city puts in the money to make sure it's fully funded. And if they don't put in enough, you might not necessarily fund at the dollar. By the way, I don't know how my, I, when I were in a finance department, my employees asked help with calculations, but they knew the retirement date and how much they would get down to the penny. It was incredible, their motivation. I mean, like I, on, on Tuesday, the 14th, I'm gonna get this much. I already went and they get it. So they have motivation to understand that, by the way. When you go through, they'll understand that because that's their retirement. I have a two-year-old. I'm not gonna retire until I'm 72 at least, so I don't have to worry about that. I'll be working till I die. Five-year CIP, really critical, but more, more important than the five-year CIP, get the grant funding that matches it and you think about that. I do remember when I was putting one together, if somehow Measure M was paying for everything five times. <laughs> That's why you do it. 
Oh, measure, wait, didn't we just put 200 million? Like, oh, it, that, it's just a plan, that's all it is, but it's an important one. Long range financial planning model and fiscal assessment, they go hand in hand, knowing where you're gonna be. Budgeting practices and financial decision making. They wanna know those one-time fixes. These things are the things that are important and that is a practice, right? And ideally, you actually implement in a policy how you're gonna do things. Strategic plan, economic development strategy. This is what Larry was talking about. At the end of the day, how are you gonna get there? You wanna change your community, you wanna change things? Great, how are we gonna do it? You need something to think about that. Otherwise, it can be a little hodgepodge, right? It's not whoever comes, you want that parcel and you know you have a plan for that and you've thought about that strategically, great. Those are the reasons, frankly, you get those consultants to think about that strategically with you. This is what's really playing now or where we wanna be. Okay, the last one, housing element, RENA land compliant surplus land act. Larry will talk to you a little bit about this, but this is important because I do believe the landscape has changed completely now. The state has taken actually away a lot of your zoning capacity. In the old days when I was there, I, I had zoning. That was the thing I could, I could give you density bonus. State's taken away everything. Like, hey, Julio, all your tools are gone. So now you really have to think about creatively how you're gonna get to these goals. Does anyone know what developer remedy is? Builders Sorry, builder's remedy. Sorry, builder's remedy. No, builders it's builder's remedy, that's right. I was thinking density bonus. Um, builder's remedy in, in Santa Monica, does anyone happen? Right, they basically can, if you don't have your housing element in place, you can now amend your, your, your project and add as much density as uh, can be supportable. So how many units are we talking about in the case of Santa Monica? 4,600, you're up on that, Jelly. That's right, 4,610. And originally they had like, uh, maybe like 1,000, I think. The arena's 9,000 for perspective. Yeah, they're just gonna, and the population of that city is 91,000. So those, they're gonna add another 10,000 population just with those units in the pipeline. So pay attention to this. Otherwise, you may have unintended consequences, or I actually say 10 years from now, you can see a lot of beach cities with this one tower that's 37 stories. Like, how did that get done? Oh, builder's remedy. Okay, other things you probably should have. Leverage your transportation, uh, TOD monies, okay? Citizen's budget, always a good thing to have so someone doesn't have to read through, how big is yours that thick? Yeah. All right, and then IT management plan. Uh, usually you usually have an annual rating conversation, that's not for you guys though, but you should, just to give an update as to where you are. Pension costs, why it's big, why it's important to think about. Okay, there are two things to a pension cost. Your normal cost and your UAL, which is a past due number. Understand that, one is the blue cost, I'm focusing on what's called your UAL, this is your past due amount, okay? This is what really crushes a lot of people. And we talked about this before, right? Passing it on. That's been the solution. I don't have to deal with it today, but now you do. Okay, these are a lot of numbers, so I apologize. But this is what you really have to understand. Each and every year, CalPERS adjusts your liability. They add something called an amortization base. They basically mark it to market. So you're, if you say, hey, last year was a different number, that's right, and the next year it's gonna be a different number. Every year it changes and they adjust it. It's dynamic. So you have to actively manage it. And there's a lot of detail behind it. We create models to this and we model out so you really understand how to deal with it. But here's what you need to do. You have to understand when you address your liability that it's a, a layer cake. That's a pretty good looking one. You know, a lot of people like that blueberry layer. Some people like, you know, the, the cream. But that's how you address it. Which one do you wanna do? Do you wanna have a budgetary impact? You're looking for a total maximum. Once you get that layer cake and understand all those numbers just represented a layer, a color, then you're like, oh, okay, this is simple. This much money, this is how I choose it. <sighs> okay, let me tell you one quick story. I don't have much time. All those decisions, SB 400, AB 616, when pensions went up, were decided when the stock market was up. See that? You're 140% funded. And then the union said, hey, let's give out some of this money, you're rich. And then people were not very good at making an argument, but here's the worst part. When did cities start to implement the changes? 
when you're 80 or 90% funded. But back then, you were doing back on economics of 140% funded. And to make matters worse, you never put a penny in the till. You increased the benefits by 30, 40%, and you didn't put a penny in there saying, hey, we had plenty in there. That's the simple way of explaining this major. Now, one last thing. Not only did you increase the benefits, but you made them retroactive for employees. Someone who had worked 20 years now increased their pay Next day, 20% increase in your pay across the board. It was not a good financial decision. Now, you add on top of that other changes and investment losses, and look at this. You have investment boom, investment boom, and guess what? You're still at 80% funded. This is your funding level, 80% at best. You never put a money, any money in the system. Essentially, it makes it difficult. So this is a past-due cost. And now it's been 20 plus years, it's time to pay it. Hopefully you kind of get this. I think it illustrates and helps a lot when people say this and start to understand it. Okay, so the good news. Last year, CalPERS, two years ago, CalPERS returned 21.3%. You got this great big gain. People were really happy, right? So that was your 2020 number right there. And wow, my payments went down tremendously good. So as we say, no good deed goes unpunished. What happens the next year? CalPERS last year had a 6.1% loss. And remember, they're supposed to earn 6.8%. That's their investment benchmark. So it's really a 13% loss. So the year before they had, and remember, let's go back over these numbers. 21.3%, at that time the discount rate was seven, is a 14.3% gain. Okay, so it's not, it's zero. You have to make seven or now 6.8. So your, your benchmark is actually seven. So they did pretty good, 14% gain. Look, your payments went down dramatically. Next year, but remember, you have to make 6.8. You have a negative 6.1% loss. It's a 13% loss, and that loss is even worse because you have that 20% gain the year before. So you're actually worse than you were before. So I'm now giving you this kind of um, uh, back to the future. You now know where you're gonna be in August. You can call me in August when you get that actuarial report, but I'm telling you now, it's bad, okay? So if you're budgeting based on that other number, tell everyone, I know it's gonna be bad already. Don't budget on something. You already know the number. CalPERS reported that loss last year. So some things, you have tools in your toolbox, you gotta pay attention. I like this one. What can you do? There's seven things you can do. It's not all pension obligation bonds, it is one thing. And right now, pension obligation bonds, otherwise known as POBs, are off the table. If you did them back then, congratulations. You can't do them right now, rates are too high. But there are other things you can do. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about them. Which one do you like better? Okay, so this is the last part on kind of numbers and colors. Remember that layer cake? Well, this kind of shows you that same illustration of layer cake. You choose that color based on what impact you want to have, budgetary or cash flow. These are some numbers, and I promise this is as much as we're going to go through this, but that's how you have to think about it because it's a big liability. I mean, let's go back to this one and see. That's $388 million. Now it went back up to 701. Big. Big annual payments. And this is what we're talking about, level of service, right? Those are like fixed payments, they go up, that impacts level of service. By the way, your salaries go up, all your other costs go up, and these are fixed dollar repayments that you're on. CalPERS puts you on a payment plan. That's why it's important. It's not important to solve pension. It's important because when Larry comes up and you want to do some sexy new project, pension's getting in the way. You lower this cost, down here, down to this, and now you have some breathing room. That's all it is, breathing room. So you can do the things that you came into council to do. Change the look and feel of your community, provide a level of service, do the things that you want to do. No one comes in to solve pension except for me. Right, and I, you say, what do you, I'm the pension, uh, that, that conversation lasts about 35 seconds during a, a cocktail party, right? So what's the last thing to pay? Anyone know what OPEB is? Retiree medical. I actually think it's more difficult. The other stuff is plain math. Where I have a problem is OPEB because those are 
Retiree med uh, retiring medical costs are based on medical inflation, which is two and a half the times the rate of inflation. The only thing that goes up with medical insurance premiums are Frank at USC. That's the only other thing, right? Annual tuition in universities is the only thing that goes up with medical costs. It's the only thing. None of the stuff you guys came to hear. Thank you, guys. So we were talking about the context of budgeting and finance being sort of, it, it can be a standalone set of activities, but it really shouldn't be, not in this new economy. So the key to these slides and this part of the presentation is to walk you through how we're looking at economic development these days. Because at the end of the, at the, end of the cycle, other than pension fund costs, which as Julio just went through, are really hard to lasso for a lot of reasons. The other budgetary constraints are capturable with economic growth if you do it the right way. The tricky thing about economic growth is you may not like the direction of that growth. You may not want to make the investment alongside by side with the private sector. I mean, you could probably fill up every community in the Inland Empire today with a big box industrial, but that's probably not the right solution. So all I'm saying is, the reason why you want these guidance systems is to understand how you can navigate. So housing is not a loss leader. At, at Cosmont, we believe, unlike the, I think, the messaging that city managers and finance directors and community development directors have been giving us, we disagree. In this world, new housing can generate new tax revenues. Julio pointed out the property tax is very stable. That means it's leverageable. Look at the values in California, they're high, so that helps. Look at the need for housing, demand, so that helps. The question is how do you bottle up housing, how do you capture it, and how do you put it next to other tax generators so that it's accretive? Retail is not just retail anymore, what do we mean by that? If you're solving only for retail, you're solving for the wrong answer, right? But it is a question of what else retail plus that will work in your community? Is it medical services, depending on demographics? Is it entertainment because you don't have a community that has a center yet? Is it a redo of downtown? So the one thing you need to know is that, you, that the United States is way overbuilt on retail. So not only has the digital world disheveled retail, we already had done that. We are, uh, what is it, 26 square feet per person in the United States and the closest country is four or five times that. So we are way over retail compared to Europe and Britain. So, you know, it's, there's no real future. We have to right size. We talked about telework reconfiguring. There is value add for local communities, again, because wallets stay in local communities longer. And industrial is critical for the economy because it's the way we move goods now. That is the way we move goods. So the way we look at it is the housing unit is a place where people live, work, and shop. And that's sort of the basis for needing rooftops and putting them in places that can capture more sales, more activity. What you are going to see a lot of, by the way, there are 250 regional shopping centers in California that represent 26,000 acres of parking lots, right? I mean, it's a crazy notion. Here's another crazy notion. All of those parking lots are protected by reciprocal easement agreements. Do you know what that is? Those are recorded covenants that say that Macy's and J.C. Penney's, despite the fact that they're dinosaurs, have unilateral veto rights over the introduction of every new use. So I, I don't know your name. Gentlemen talked about equity. One of the most inequitable things is, yes. Right, one of the most inequitable things is that the shopping center got built on the back of protecting parking. Mm -hmm. And it is something that really trespasses on the very intent of the Housing Accountability Act. That's why I'm on your message, because I'm trying to introduce legislation that would enable all of us locally to create a district using EIFD, which I'm gonna talk about, that would allow the reuse for residential and vacate these reciprocal easement agreements. Here's where this world is going, retail corridors, retail centers, converting into blended use. So for your budget, that means a higher set of values. 
but the uses have to be productive. And the thing is, is that creative office, mm, maybe, maybe not. Biotech, I think so in California, high value, high return, typical office less. Housing, certainly, hotel, somewhat. Those are the blended uses, medical for sure. We talked about the fact that telecommuting is reshaping office districts. I won't spend a lot more time on this. I'm just trying to be efficient in that what we're going to find more and more as, you know, Amazon's um, perspective is that they would like to be, you know, less than an hour from every major metropolitan region. And they pretty much have filled in that formula. Now it's about infill sites, the ability to take the stress off the large box and move it to a mid box with a smaller truck so they can really continue to penetrate neighborhoods. That's what retail is fighting. And the emerging trends. So we're seeing retail and industrial converting. What do I mean by that? You're gonna see applications in your community in the redo of those regional centers. You're gonna see requests for an old JC Penny to become a mini distribution center on site. Here's the interesting notion about that. It means all of the small shops that are left and by the way, have you been to a regional center lately? Those small shops are now, someone said this before, they're advertising billboards because there's no one in there. Right, so the ones that are left though get to be more competitive if they can store on site and deliver from on site. So they can use a smaller store, you can buy any good and they're gonna hook it to the JCPenney which is now a distribution center and it goes straight to your house before you get home. That's the way retail is gonna survive. So, the notion that industrial is poisonous, nah, it's just where do you fit distribution to support the other uses, right? So that you're gonna find that equation. And office, this gets to my whole point about office looking like residential, right? Uh, basically, until office could convert itself into another use, what you will have is residential stepping up and providing office space for the renters. Right? So we're calling resi mercial new term. We're so good in real estate about inventing new terms. <laughs> That's because we're always trying to impress lenders. Okay, so here are your tools. And this will go, I think, fast, but I wanted to give you a sense that if you are really serious about managing your budget, which you should be as a leader, here's how you do it. You figure out a way to elevate the productivity of your budget by using the investment in the private sector to further the advantages of your community to make it more attractive and do it in a way where you capture value and you create currency for yourself. Put yourself in the marketplace so you extract value out of it. So how do you do it? I think I said this earlier. I've never understood, and I was a community development director, why we give zoning away in specific plans. Why do we do that? I mean, it's sort of a planner's dream that says, this is what it's gonna look like, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, but if you really give away the zoning and you have no lever for it, it's really not gonna look like that. It's really just gonna raise the price and the value of the people that own the real estate that had, had the old Pep Boys and they have no motivation to make that into a mixed use site. Here's different. High owner, family owner of Pep Boys that no longer live in the city and haven't for centuries. Hi. Why are you looking at me? No. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi. I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> we just made the zoning from one to one density to four to one density. We had to do it anyway because the state told us to. Good news. Bad news for you. You don't have it. We have it. We created it and we have it but it's approved. We're gonna use it to trade off to someone who's gonna come along and use that density and give us some amenities in a pre-approved list. That trade off is gonna be a development agreement trade off and that's what will enable going from one to one to four to one, but the four to one is approved. So that means now put our buyer hat on. Now you and I are a developer. We wanna to go to her community. And we've seen this old Pep Boys. It's like this little store on a big lot, right? It's just a dinosaur. And it's owned by some family on the East Coast. Okay, so now, instead of with the specific plan giving them an automatic four to one that just raises their sale price, because what happens after that is your local broker says, hi, Mr. and Mrs. East Coast, 
Did you know that the city council just gave you four to one zoning? So in case you ever wanted to sell on a 1031 exchange, it's now worth four times what you thought it was. What do we get out of it as a city? We just gave that family the bonus plan. We just kept generational wealth in place. Okay, it, instead of saying, Mr. Developer, it's approved, but you gotta go buy it. But when you put it in an escrow and you come to us with a plan, we will negotiate only with you, not with them. We're not giving them the value, we're giving you the value of our zoning action, and you give us a project that we want, and you satisfy some of the checklist amenities that we wanted, and pre-approved. There's no mystery here. The density is approved, the amenities are approved. Let's just do a deal. So what you've done is that family maybe gets a 10% pop in value, but not a four times pop in value. And that's the whole thing about the old versus new playbook. So. When you hear a specific plan in your community, call us and let us talk to your CD director. Let's not give away zoning. Let's capture currency, capture value. Okay, so, and then, and this is just, Buellton has done it. We've done it a bunch of different places. They wanted certain amenities, right, on their primary uh, street. And so they wanted rest. So they approved all these amenities and then they increased density up to 40 units per acre, heights, the whole thing. They conducted the study, they made this batch of zoning, and now they basically trade it off for deals. It's really not rocket science. Here's another one that's not rocket science. If you know in your community that the private sector is gonna invest because you have some green fields, because you have a biotech community, and you know someone's gonna invest, but you need to revitalize your downtown, why not consider putting that green field area and the downtown, and maybe a transit stop area, and maybe an old retail corridor, unattached, all in enhanced infrastructure financing districts. What's that? Those are districts that were approved by the state in 2014 to replace redevelopment. They allow you to create tax increment. One of the, now, it's not as powerful as redevelopment was for a lot of reasons, but it does have some power to it. And one of the powers is that you can, as this city did, you can put areas like the blue that was gonna grow on its own and attach it to like the yellow, which is the regional mall, which is dying. And you can take the upside in the blue and move it to the yellow. And that's really what I call value capture. And it works like this. Once you establish the area, all of the property tax, I think I have a pointer, sort of freezes at the gray. It's a 45 year district. Anything new that gets built or any new assessment is tax increment. The tax increment can be reinvested in that district. By doing that, you told the private sector that you're gonna reinvest and you motivate their investment. It's just value capture. It's value generation, value capture. Another great tool, and there are a bunch of these districts. The newest district, for those of you that are in greener communities or really wanna be green, is called a climate resiliency district. Just approved this year, Senate Bill 820 became law January 1. But they're all about the same thing. They're about sustainability, resiliency, infrastructure. It's a way to manage the end product of land that's gonna recycle. It's a way of chasing private investment, taking it under your hood, under your wings, and redirecting it to the areas that need it. Just something that when you're considering a budget and you're struggling on a balance, why aren't you thinking about capturing value from zoning and capturing value and putting it together through a special district. And by the way, these things go hand in hand. You can, you can hold that zoning for property that you put in a special district, and it's a double victory. You essentially sell or trade off the zoning, and you get the value increase, and you take that and put it to work on infrastructure. There's lots of communities doing it, by the way. This is no secret. What I'm telling you is all part of the elixir going forward. It's a new world out there. We've got 40 or 50 of these going, and you can see the uses, right? Housing, remediation, housing. To your point, transit, it's all laid. That's because all these communities have the issue that you're talking about. Transit is dying. They're all re old retail corridors or underdeveloped. So they're putting them in these districts to do value capture and induce private. So that's why I wanna put that uh, transit slide back in. It really is supported by this, so thank you for that. By the way, if you look at these communities, they're all so different. Look, Napa and Oakland, they are not kissing cousins, I'm sorry. You know, so, you know, it's just amazing, you know. And that's because these, these uh, cities, 
It's the vehicle, it's not the city. You know, I always say to my clients, you've seen one EIFD, you've seen one EIFD, because these are just business plans. They're really a way to sort of size up your community, figure out where you need the help, where the growth's gonna be, and put it to work. It's a business plan. It's a value capture business plan that gets augmented by that zoning mechanism that I was telling you about. There's no one size fits all, by the way. You have to use a little bit of all of these things, tax increment, zoning value capture or currency capture. You know, then there's the new rules that are always there to upset the apple cart. So the state, gotta love the state, you know, every time they wake up, they look for a different way to sort of, you know, unmake our beds. So the Surplus Land Act. Okay, so this is an idea that's been around for 30 years because before you sold land as a city, you needed to offer it out to schools and other, you know, agencies, right? Other public agencies. Whoa, there's an upgrade to that now. As of two years ago, any land, any piece of property owned by any city, county, district has to first offer that land out to an affordable housing developer before it can sell it. It can sell it at fair market value, but it must go through that process. Okay, that, the notion of that isn't bad at all. Here's the tough part for cities. I'm sure this is no secret to you, but city managers turn over, council members turn over. You buy a property in 1990, by 2010, no one remembers the property. By 2020, no one remembers who bought the property, right? And so now the state comes along and says, hey, you know that property garage you have? The right-of-ways you bought, the downtown piece? You go, yeah, I think so. You need a garage sale permit for that. Before you can do anything with it, you need our blessing. You have to go through the Surplus Land Act process. So it forces all of us on the local level to do what I call an asset strategy plan, and that is go into the garage that still has the kids' hockey and all that other stuff and say, what do we have? And what could we use to either comply with RENA, improve the transit corridor, sell it to an adjacent owner for something to remodel the center, Whatever, do that inventory, and then here's the other message. Get it out from under the SLA as quickly as you can, because guess what? These rules are only gonna get worse and worse, because the state didn't do it well the first time around. We know ways through it, and pretty on a pretty expedited basis, but those windows are gonna close, those doors are gonna close. So the opportunity is to really figure out which assets you have. Look at the old parking structures that some downtowns have. They're never gonna use them as parking structures again because they're half full. Maybe that's a housing site, maybe that's a mixed use site. The point is, is that those sooner, we call it emancipation from the SLA, we're gonna do a t-shirt, but that's what you wanna do, is get out from under it. All right, OPM, other public money. We live in a world that's post-COVID, so there's been a, just a plethora of money that's become available. That's another source to add to tax increment financing, value capture zoning, or density opportunity reserve zoning, DOR zoning, to the asset strategy we just talked about in the Surplus Land Act. Who knows which of those properties are eligible for a grant because you're gonna use it for a resiliency measure, right? Maybe it's a buffer to a forest. It doesn't matter if you're a rural, suburban, urban, urban suburban. All of this is about figuring out what the requirements are that the state has put on you for density and surplus land, taking the tools that allow you to create value and value capture, and move the budget in a productive way. That's the way we all have to think. And that's where you're not gonna get that lesson from GFOA, you're not gonna get the lesson from the finance directors, you're not gonna get the lesson from your city manager because it's such a new world. So it's really up to all of us to understand the, pl the playground we're in and do the best we can. Now, one of the gifts we have is that we have tax exempt financing. And that means that the interest paid on the loans we take, whether it's for a public-private deal or just for pure public use, a city hall infrastructure, is less in cost because we can pass along a tax break. The interest that gets paid to the investor just doesn't get taxed, it's tax exempt. That means that we've got lower capital borrowing costs which we can pass along to the private sector in a public-private deal. That's also something that captures value, especially today. I don't know if you saw in the news today, but First Republic, by the way, my bank, is sort of teetering because it did a very bad investment on digital currency, right? 
We've got a crazy world right now, you know, and, and the fact is, is that private money is more expensive now than it was just two years ago, by a whole boatload, by the way. All of us building stuff could get loans at 2 to 3%. That's now 7%, 6.7%. So the point is, is that tax-exempt financing gives us the ability to enter a deal pass it through to the private sector in exchange for things we want. These are called public-private deals. So how do you do that? So this is a kind of an interesting slide. It's not one that you'd see in most courses that you have in the, in the public sector. We put it together for Khaled, I think. I'm on the board of Khaled. So here what we say is that, just what I was talking about, the private sector, when they come to your community, they're going to have a base of funding. We know that as debt and equity. Right? When we buy houses, we have two things we need, other than good credit. Equity, meaning our money, and debt, the, ones, the money we get from the lenders. Same with a private developer. They have loans and they have private equity. Here's the thing. Debt is much, much, much cheaper than equity. Much cheaper. So if debt costs you 7%, equity costs you 21% or 17%. That's why it's a smaller part of the capital stack. We call those capital stacks. And that's why when our tax-exempt financing comes into play and we reduce, we increase the debt package by reducing the equity package, we're, for the developer, taking a 17% or 20% cost and reducing it to a tax-exempt rate, 4 or 5%. Hey, Larry, yeah. That, that private equity for that Investment, that's 100% loss, right? That's gone. It's gone. Mm. It's such a good point. Not only is it expensive, right? But it's gone because it's at risk money. So now they're fighting for that ROI. Now, right. Now they're fighting for the ROI. But that's why it's more expensive because, you know, by the time you get the loan, you have a deal. See, Mark's already given you 10 to 1 zoning. So they go, oh, yeah, look, you know, right? Hawthorne or whatever, you know, uh, Gardena gives us, you know, 10 to 1 zoning. Now it's worth so much money on a reappraisal that they reduce the capital stack and they're borrowing at 7%. All I'm saying is if you want the deal to look more like and have the components that you want, whether it's medical or retail, whatever, you can use your cheap money to recast the project because you can change the equation on the developer's cost, right? That's why this is an important slide. If you go then, if you basically take that notion in the first column, what the developer com comes to you, right, Mark, when they say, I need some help, it's because they have identified a gap. They can't make it work. The lender's saying, pound sand. So they come to you, help me pound sand. And they say, okay, can you give me some low cost money? Because now I can go back to the lender. And you say, yeah, not so quick. Here, I need a police station. I'm just making things up. I'm saying, that's the trade off, right? So that's where we come in. We calculate the new revenues for. Yes, redevelopment money covered that gap in the, fa in the past because you didn't need to make a public benefit finding. Right. The public benefit was assisting the private sector. That was the stated purpose of redevelopment. Today, the stated purpose is infrastructure, though. And you, you invest in the infrastructure, which reduces the cost in the first column. You put in the light, you reduce the cost, improves the capital stack. It's the same thing. We just push the pieces around differently. And then we assess private financing options and then we, we assess public-private financing options, step three, meaning, okay, our capital stack in one isn't so good. We could find a way to put some public money in, recalculate the capital stack, and then we can do a deal that uses tax increment financing or lower cost financing. And maybe the city, if they create this special district, which is more and more eligible for grant sources than just a pure city alone, will go get some grants and now we have a deal. We have a public-private deal. This is what Mark just said. He goes, you want to do housing, but now if I do 100% housing in Gardena, I don't need his help. I just need the zoning, right? But he needs to put in 20 units out of 100 for affordable. I'm just making a number up. Okay, guess what? That just created a gap because those 20 units can't pay the market rent, to your point, right? We got to help them. Right? We gotta help those affordable units come online and we have compliance requirements. Okay, how do we, these boxes are filling this box, right? This is sort of the little menu. We have grants, we have community facility districts. We talk about that another time. We have tax increments, we have cash infusion that we can do. It's, this is just 
the game you play to see if you can get the scales to equal out to deliver what you want. In your case, in this case, it's affordable housing. But it could be a community facility, it could be a, a theater, it could be a roadway improvement, it could be a transit corridor improvement, right? It could be a lot of things. This is not solving for any one thing, it's solving the equation to deliver something. Thing is, you gotta know what that something is. It really is. You know, it's funny, when all the years I worked for city councils as a city manager and as a finance officer, I said, oh, you know, I think my job's pretty simple at one level. You know, it's like I got to tell you all the same thing and I'm here to do what you want. Here's the tough part. You have to know what you want. And you're not just one person. You're five or you're seven. So other than doing something totally illegal, which I would just tell you about, or totally stupid, which I would tell you about. The rest is about getting done what you want, but you have to know what you want. So this equation is valuable if you know where you want to go. Budgeting, balancing a budget, and doing the management is valuable if you know where you want to go with it. And that's how you move communities forward. So this, uh, this is really just a more of an explanation of that last graphic. I don't have to go through it. It's really a matter of managing the private capital stack in a way that delivers if there's a gap which you want on the public side by using the public capital stack to help that forward. That's the essence of a public-private deal, period. No more, no less. Then there's all these things that people like Julio and I use to really make you sh make sh have you be sure that you really need us, all right? And that is general obligation bonds, COPs, water and sewer. These are just all ways to create debt if you decide that you want debt. If you decide that debt is the way to fill this box, if you decide it's not, and we help you make that decision, then we're not going that way. We're going a different way. That's the point. You see, we have no predisposition about what you should do to fill the gap. We have a predisposition to help you fill the gap because that you've said that this is what I want under my Christmas tree. This is what I want to get. It's a park. It's a mixed-use project. It's affordable housing. It's infrastructure. It's a community amenity, it's whatever. But that's the importance of knowing what your economic development objectives are, and that's the importance about having a healthy budget to support that so you're not distracted from moving forward in a very productive way. That's where these things cross together. This is just a calculation as to why tax exempt yields make sense for uh, private sector because they reduce their capital stack cost. And here's the financing team that you need to get these things done because there's a lot of compliance, there's a lot of regulatory requirements when you use government financing for either government uses or government public-private deals. That's all this is. I'm gonna wrap this up by basically indicating, we talked about some of the P3s. The one thing about P3s that you can do is if you have a budget crunch and you wanna push some of the costs of operation onto the private sector, you can rent their services. And there's a whole bunch of ways that you can enter, like vehicle towing services, legal service. There's a whole bunch of ways to sort of use private sector for public delivery. I'd spend more time on this, but I really wanna to get to where I think we ought to just wrap this up for you because I got a couple more minutes, and that is all of this is, is about a pathway to community prosperity. That's really what it's about. You have a tough job. I've been there with you. Julio's been there with you as city managers, department heads. God knows the, the amount of distractions that occur with a local community. Who could think of all the things that can happen on the way to City Hall on a Tuesday night, right? It is just nutty. But you can't lose your geography. You can't lose where you want to go. And it starts with figuring out that you want to prosper, that you want to be in a community that understands how it can best navigate prosperity out of the trends it faces. Because we started out today by saying that we're not in control. We're a service business that charges tariffs to investors and businesses in our community. That's all we are. The difference between success, prosperity, and not is figuring out where those investments are going and how to maximize them for the things we want and deliver a better community over time, deliver a better quality of life for the folks that we want, and improve and enhance opportunity for future generations. That's it, that's why I got into the business. I know that's why you're all here. So that's a, a function in today's world of figuring out the consumers have redefined their quality of life. 
We need to understand that because the sooner and the closer that we can get our communities to their definition of quality of life, the better we do and the more we capture from them. And the investor is always ahead, always ahead of us in that case. They know where to put their money because they're targeting wallets. We're collecting taxes, they're targeting wallets. So they know. So they come to us and say, give me big box industrial, I'm gonna hit a home run. You go, ah, you know, maybe, 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 maybe. Maybe we ought to focus on, if I give you big box industrial, maybe I need to fix my regional center because that's going under. Maybe I need a civic plaza. Maybe I need more residential. Maybe I need affordable housing because my community's getting old and I need younger folks. It doesn't matter. It's just that you know that the questions they ask you are self-serving and they're based on consumer activity. It's up to you to translate and to convert it to a value-add, value capture formula. You miss that boat, you miss the future. That's just the way it is. So for the public sector, that means that economic development's redefined. We need less parking. We are gonna have less retail. We're gonna have infill infra, infra industrial. We're gonna have the state jamming housing down our you know what. But we know that housing's not all bad. We have to make it work on a different, we cannot bring the bias of bring me a Costco to the table anymore. We have to understand that this is the snapshot of the future and the key considerations for us is housing, keeping wallets local, creating jobs in those households because people are staying home, they're not driving, and using your real estate, to your own assets to effectuate and help some of those. Those are key considerations. There's a lot to do. It's a big story. So all I'm saying is that you can't do it alone. It takes a huge team, you need some advisors, you need a really great management team that are big picture thinkers. You need a finance director that thinks like a CFO. You need a city manager that thinks like a creative officer. It's just a new world. And the city attorney's gonna keep you out of trouble. Okay, you need a good economic development team that's proactive and you're in the service business. So you have to pay attention. The people that have to be in the room are the people that make your quality of life for you. I mean, you're try to create allowance for them. You know, it's like your kids, you wanna raise their allowance so they can go to college. So this is the family, here's some trusted advisors. I put this up because it's easy to get a box with just the finance director and the assistant finance director on a budget discussion and approve and go have a drink. That is nothing to have a drink about. That's all I'm saying, okay? It's a different world. So here's your sort of final slide. Put your budget, finance, and ED playbook into action. They're all strung together. One of the things you have to do is when we start with Julio, you gotta get your financial act in order. You gotta know what's in your checkbook. You gotta know your budget priorities, comply, all that. But then very quickly you go, ooh, I need some help. So I have to evaluate my, what my strategies are. What do I want? How do I create value? How do I keep that value? How do I create currency through zoning? How do I keep that? How do I induce the private investment I want, not the private investment they want? How do I make it mutual? Identify your best opportunities based on one and two. Those are developer proposal, proposals, those are arena compliance measures, those are regional mall redo, transit corridor improvements, industrial distribution. Select your preferred tools. Someone asked the question about, it's hard to, I think it was you, it's hard to educate in a community in Watsonville. You have to always consistently engage the community in all of this. So every step, I put these on every one of these, but I just put it on one. You wanna stay out there and explain where are you going, why these tools, why these preferred projects. Work with your owners and developers and annually reassess your budget, your finance, and your economic development priorities because guess what? It's always changing. But if you don't do it, as I say, economic development finance, they require vigilance. It's just what has to happen. So that's it for us. I just, we are really pleased to have been here. Thank you very much for, for having us, by the way. Yeah.